I've come to learn recently that there was once a point in time where Shrek wasn't yet considered a meme. It's crazy, right? Like, I didn't believe it either, but it's true. Apparently, it was originally this thing called a film. And not just any kind of film either, the kind that wins Best Animated Picture at the Oscars. So how exactly did we get from this all-around just celebration of pure class to this? Looking back, it's really hard to wrap your head around just what the hell happened to a franchise that was once considered the cutting edge of genre parody in computer animation. Even despite its current status as top-tier meme material, Shrek's influence on the genre of modern animated movies warrants a proper in-depth analysis and well-researched discussion. But I don't want to do that, so instead I'm going to talk about Shrek 2 the video game for a while because that game is rad as fuck. Shrek 2 is exactly the kind of game that appealed to me as a young child. I liked 3D action games, I liked 4-player co-op games, and I liked Shrek. I had simple needs. Although it will always feel weird to say it these days, Shrek 1 and 2 are solid movies with well-explored premises with appealing characters and effective world-building. Playing as a grumpy ogre and his array of multi-talented fairy tale friends lends itself easily to the medium of video games, and I don't think that's a controversial statement. You've got big, strong characters, small, fast characters, and everything in between. Functionally, most of them are the same, basic punching and jumping moves. But each one's got their own unique ability, which can be anything from slowing down time, walking on tight ropes, candy cane boomerangs, and powerful exhaling, plus a really, really hard kick that can somehow warp space and time. If you fill your game with lots of playable characters, the biggest mistake you can make is having them play exactly the same way. You want players to be switching characters often. Obviously not too often, but there's a sweet spot that I think this game hits. Here's a quick ranking I did of the different characters. I generally prefer the faster and more agile ones since they're smaller targets for enemies and better suited for making precise jumps. Little Red Riding Hood, who's a completely original character, ended up being my first choice thanks to her ranged apple throws and versatile spin attack. And that's actually a pattern for this game. It's at its best when it's experimenting with the source material. Licensed games can generally be classified into one of two categories. Those which follow the story of their source material to the letter, and those that invented scenarios that better fit the structure of a video game. Shrek 2 the movie has more than enough set pieces to follow scene to scene, but I'm glad the team behind this went the extra mile. A worse version of Shrek 2 would have made a level where Shrek has to help prepare the dinner for the table scene in the movie. Instead, some of the best levels in this game are completely original set pieces that blend seamlessly into the world of Shrek. Navigating a haunted forest while preventing the three blind mice from being killed? It fits right in. A mines level in a mountain with an unexplained race of humanoid frog warriors? Why not? I will personally fight you if you talk trash about Shrek's expanded lore. The levels that do follow the movie aren't that bad either. Breaking into the fairy godmother's potion shop is a superbly varied level, and storming a burning far far away with a giant gingerbread man is as fun as it sounds. Shrek 2 falls into the grey area between 3D platformers and 3D beat-em-ups, where it's not quite one or the other, but rather a consistent mix of both that shows its flaws only when it tries to rely too much on one or the other. That is to say, the flaws of each style of gameplay become most obvious when you're put into sections directly focused on one of the two playstyles. Platforming sections that are intended to be challenging because the level design just end up drawing attention to the imprecise jumping and occasionally unclear size of certain gaps. For example, jumping around on small structures is no big deal because the penalty for falling is just a few seconds of lost time. But judging gaps like these ones one after the other is a brutal experience considering how far they send you back if you do fail. On the other hand, sections focusing too much on combat highlight just how limited the variety of attacks is, and it becomes downright frustrating when you have to beat down wave after wave of the same few enemies. Ganging up on two or three enemies is not a big deal because they can easily be dispatched by a few simple combos. And by combos I mean the same button three times in a row or just spamming your jump attack since it's way harder to hit you. But now imagine that, but in groups of 7, or 10, or 12, all throughout the level. It's not a deep fighting system. Miniboss enemies, the ones with health bars, are a little too frequent given how much button mashing it requires to take down just one of them. Often there's like 4 or 5 in a single level. It will become tedious. What's even more tedious is what happens when one of your party members dies. The camera will not leave them behind. It will remain fixated on the dead character, and let's face it, that character is going to be Shrek because Shrek is shit tier, until you beat every remaining enemy on screen. It's a design choice that makes no sense. I can't even move to a better spot in the level to fight these enemies. I'm stuck wherever I am. To the game's credit, it is constantly trying to mix up the different types of enemies. Knights, pumpkin demons, rats, elves, frog warriors, trolls, lots of variety. So to recap, the game excels when it's mixing platforming with light puzzles and light combat. Variety is key here, and the structure of its dozen or so levels reflects that. You have the more linear, story-focused levels, funneling you from set piece to set piece, ending with either a boss or a chase sequence. And on the other hand, you have these open minigame-based levels where you're free to just explore for a bit before moving on. Both these formats are a lot of fun, but I do really like the minigame format because those levels are carefully placed throughout the game to mix up things after playing through a long string of, like, three or four linear levels. Practically every level ends with what is called a hero time segment where one character in particular is singled out either for a boss fight or a minigame that takes advantage of their unique abilities. I always like these sections because it means the level design can be focused on one type of gameplay style at a time, and these segments are generally stronger for that reason. 
In addition to the main objectives of each level, there are a dozen or so side quests for each level that you can try to complete. Each level has 12 magic beans lying around, promoting creative exploration in parts of levels you wouldn't give a second thought to otherwise. For the life of me, I can't remember exactly how they're unlocked, but you also got a few bonus levels you can access through the menu screen that are neat if you like simple time trials. By the way, this is one of my favorite co-op games on the GameCube. It's ideally played with two or three people to keep it from getting too hectic. This is the kind of game that's most fun when you're yelling at your friends. My biggest gripe, though, with multiplayer is that everyone has control of the camera. Everyone. Not split screen, si just single screen, everyone has control. It's the biggest oversight I've seen in a game in a long time. Now the writing here is nothing too special, mostly a lot of passable puns, but there are a few good bits here and there. The Grand Theft Auto star rating in Far Far Away stands out as one. Visually, the game is really well put together, at least considering the time period. Lots of grand looking environments with plenty of vertical height, and in some cases you can even see later parts of the level far off in the background. The textures are just detailed enough to pull off the grimy pseudorealism associated with the art style of the movies, while still remaining cartoony enough to avoid the uncanny valley. Facial animations can look downright sloppy sometimes, and this one night enemy is clearly just Shrek's character model with some armor on it, but overall I don't have much to complain about in the graphics department. The soundtrack feels perfectly tailored for every situation you find yourself in, be it a cheerful snail eyeball search in Shrek's swamp or a Minds of Moria-esque battle through a mountain. In fact, I like the soundtrack so much, I went out and bought an autographed copy of it from the composer. This is a real thing that I did. I paid $24 for this. Quite frankly, the fact that I spent that much money on something I never listened to is the only reason I made this video. That is $24 I am never getting back, and I need as many people as possible to know that. This has been a public service announcement. Remember kids, never go full shitpost.